Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, this is John McDougall. I am the event coordinator here at Murder by the Book in Houston. And we're super excited for tonight's event. But before we get into it, I just wanted to make some general store announcement stuff. Um, first, I'm sure many of you who are tuning in know we were supposed to have uh, William Kent Kruger in the store with us um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and unfortunately, we had to pivot to virtual. And we have big, big thanks to Kent for um, for for being able to do that so quickly. Um, so I think he was the last of the in-store stuff that we had had scheduled now being virtual. Uh, just an update at the moment, we are not planning any more in-store things for the rest of this year. So we'll continue doing virtual events through the end of 2021. We're gonna try to get some stuff on the books for 2022, fingers crossed that we'll actually be able to have those happen. Um, but it seemed like, um, a little too much. It sort of broke our spirit to have to cancel the stuff that we had in store. So we're, we don't want to have to do that again. And with the holidays coming, we know events will slow down a little bit. Uh, we know that everybody has said that once we start doing in-store stuff, they don't want us to stop doing virtual. That definitely will not happen. We'll still be able to do some virtual stuff. We're trying to still figure out kind of what that will look like. But so we are definitely will not abandon the virtual world. It's been great to be able to connect with other readers all over the country um, while we were doing this. So those, those are definitely here to stay. Uh, we've got some really great stuff coming Coming up, um, we are going to be chatting with um, some of the uh, contributors for Palm Springs Noir on Thursday. That's going to be uh, Barbara DeMarco Barrett uh, speaking with Eric Beatner, Janet Finch, and Eduardo Santiago. We're super excited about that. If you are interested in other short story collections, we're also going to be doing a launch event for the, I'm just getting it pulled up here so I can get all the details right. Uh, the Best American Mystery and Suspense uh, 2021. Uh, thing. We're going to be doing a launch event for that on October 12th with the editors Steph Cha and Elifir Burke. And they're going to be joined by Nikki Dolson, Alex Segura, and Laura Lippman. And speaking of Alex Segura, we're so excited. We'll be making official announcements soon. But we have just partnered with the Crime Writers of Color. We're going to be hosting a reading, reading series with them every other month. We're going to start in October. It's going to be hosted by Alex Segura and Kelly Garrett. If you guys turned into the panel that we did uh, last month uh, for BoucherCon, you'll know they're fantastic. We're so excited to be doing this with them. Uh, their first panel is going to be on October 21st. First, uh, talking about edge of your seat thrillers. Of course, Alex and Carrie, uh, Kelly will be there to host the whole thing, but they're going to be spe speaking with Yasmin Anjo, uh, Rachel Housel Hall, Sylvia Moreno Garcia, Ed Amer, John Vircher. John Vircher and Cheryl Head. So lots of really great stuff coming up. So if you have not checked out the Murder by the Book website, we've just gotten all of the October events added up there. Uh, last thing I'll mention is we are open. So if you haven't come into the store to visit us in a while, please come see us. Uh, we are requiring masks in the store, but we hope that you will come visit us. We know that there are still some people that are not getting out and about again. Um, so if you're still doing curbside pickup, you can always give us a call and we are happy to run stuff out. But I'm going to get us started this evening. We're super excited to be joined by William Kent Kruger. How are you tonight, Kent? Doing exceptionally well, John. Thank you for asking. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm so sad that we don't have you in the store, but I'm so glad that we still get to hear you talk about Lightning Strike and be able to do something virtual with you. Here, here. And I wanted to mention, we do still have a few tipped in signed copies of the book. So if you guys have not ordered your copy yet, I'll drop a link in the chat once they start talking. If you wanna order signed copies, we still have them available. As I mentioned, Kent's newest book in the Quirk O'Connor series is Lightning Strike. Um, and Kent is officially, he is the New York Times bestselling author of This Tender Land, Ordinary Grace, which won the Edgar Award for Best Novel, as well as 18, 18 acclaimed books in the Court O'Connor Mystery Series, including Desolation Mountain and Sulphur Springs. He lives in the Twin Cities with his family. You can learn more at WilliamKentKruger.com. And um, I feel like there's a big award somewhere that is not in that bio that you won, too, for Ordinary Grace. Am I right? Yeah, there are. there's just a slew of awards in there, John, so don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> um, it's like, I know I'm missing something. But so we're also super excited and uh, big thanks to David Hesco Wombly Wyden for uh, getting, um, for agreeing to do this. I know he and Kent are big fans of each other, so I think it's going to be a really great conversation with us tonight. How are you tonight, David? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us this evening. So yeah. David's uh, debut novel, Winter Counts, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. It has won, speaking of awards, it's won uh, the Lefty Award for Best Debut Mystery, the Thriller Award, the Barry Award, the McCavity, the Anthony Award. Um, we, were so, we were so excited to get to hear David read from it um, when we did the Crime Writers of Color panel. So if you missed that uh, last month, definitely go back and you can see that 
on the store's YouTube channel. Um, he's going to be chatting with Kent this evening, but before I turn it over to them, uh, his official bio. Uh, so David is um, an enrolled citizen of the Sikangu Lakota Nation and received his MFA from the institution or from the Institute of American Indian Arts. He's a McDowell Colony uh, Fellow and a Tin House Scholar and the recipient of the Pan American Writing. I cannot read tonight. I'm sorry. Pen America Writing for Justice Fellowship. He's a lawyer and professor, and he lives in Denver, Colorado with his family. So while they are chatting this evening, um, if you guys have questions for either author, either about their current books, upcoming stuff, uh, uh, the writing process, any of that, you can post those in the live chat on YouTube or the comments on Facebook, and we will get to them in a little bit. But for now, David, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you guys chat, and I will see you in just a little bit. All right. Well, hello everyone, and hello Kent. What a what a pleasure it is to sort of turn the tables here. You were kind enough to appear with me during my launch week about a a, a year ago, just over a year ago. So what a what a pleasure it is. And I, I've got some some great questions for you. But I want to for all of our listeners out there, uh, Kent is so modest. Um, I I want to bring up a few things here that he's too modest to say himself. In 2005 and 2006, Kent Kruger won back to back. Anthony Awards uh, for Best Novel. And in 2014, his standalone book, Ordinary Grace, won the Edgar Award for Best Novel. And his novel, This Tender Land, happens to be my favorite book that I read in 2020, a, a fact that I wrote about in my essay in the uh, website, The Millions, uh, The Year in Reading. I was uh, delighted to speak about how much that novel meant to me, given that my own grandmother had spent some time in one of the native boarding schools. But we are here tonight to talk about this fantastic book, okay? Uh, I loved Lightning Strike, folks. I loved it, okay? And I was fortunate enough to get an early copy of it. Now, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but I am not ashamed to tell you that I shed some tears at the end of this book. Now, in preparation uh, for our talk tonight, I, I went back to that last chapter again, and, and it affected me just as deeply. Um, so, friends, if, if you have not had a chance to pick up this book, do yourself a favor. I am speaking to you from my heart here, and I am telling you, it's a great read, it's a great mystery, and it's so much more. This, this, this is why we read crime fiction. This is it right here. So I'm I'm just tremendously honored to speak with uh, Kent tonight. And so Kent, I'm going to shut up here, and I'm going to let you, you know, without giving any spoilers, tell us a little bit about this book. And specifically, I'd like to know why was this the right time to tell Cork O'Connor's origin story? Um, I will answer that in just a moment, but uh, I want to uh, say that. One of my goals as a writer is always to make grown men cry, David. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it worked. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I hope everybody out there really understands um, what a magnificent individual you are in our mystery community. Um, you know, I was looking at the list of awards you've won today, and it was page after page after page, followed by starred review, rave review after rave review. Winter, you broke onto the scene in, in such a tremendous way, David. I'm so happy for you. Okay, so Lightning Strike. Um, Lightning Strike is a prequel. Uh, for those of you who don't know my Cork O'Connor series, it is it uh, takes place in the summer that Cork is 12 years old, and I'm I'm giving nothing away in saying that it is the su uh, the summer a year before his father, who is sheriff of Tamarack County, is killed in the line of duty. Um, you learn that in the first chapter, or if you have followed my my series, uh, that I'm that's not a secret. Um, my agent david for years has been the kind thing way to put it would be urging really it's pretty much insisting <laughs> that i write a prequel uh because so often in in the 17 books previous books in my cork o'connor series i have made uh reference to events and individuals in cork's past who were important or that were important in shaping him 
And my agent for years has been saying, this is such rich territory. You need to mine this. And quite honestly, I didn't have another idea for a Cork O'Connor novel. <laughs> so I thought, oh, what the hell? Let's give it a shot. And I'm really, I'm really happy I did because I just, I dearly love this story. I had such, um, really such great fun exploring Cork as a, as a kid, as an adolescent, um, exploring the relationship that Cork had with his father, the relationship Cork had with his mother, the relationship his parents had with each other, all of these important relationships that were significant in shaping Cork into the man who occupies center stage for the series. But it was also just enormously fun to go back and uh, and visit some of the characters who are quite old or actually dead in the series and uh, and explore their, the nature of those characters a great deal more. So Henry Malou, my Ojibwe healer, who is, as I write the series these days, 106 years old, is like a spry 60-year-old guy in this. And he was a lot of fun to work with. Um, Sam Wintermoon, who is, for those of you who don't know the series, Sam Wintermoon um, was a very good friend of Cork's father and uh, owns a a hamburger joint on the shore of Iron Lake. Um, and eventually Sam Wintermoon deeds that um, that burger shack to Cork. Um, but Sam Wintermoon has gone through most of the series. So it was enjoyable for me to go back and make Sam a significant part of this story, as well as uh, Grandma Dilsey, who I made reference to many, many times. And I have to tell you, Grandma Dilsey was one of my favorite characters in the whole story. I just loved how erudite she was and how um, how profound she was in her defense of her people. So it allowed me to do a lot of things that I had never really been able to do before. And in the end, create a story that I think is just a terrific addition to, to the series. And I'm so happy that you enjoyed it, David. I really did. And, you know, when you were writing it, it sounds like you were going back to some of these characters and approaching them in a little bit of a different way. Uh, you know, earlier on in their lives and such, did, you know, you and I both know when you're writing a book, sometimes you, you have an idea where it's going to go, but sometimes it may veer off. A character may veer off into a little different direction. Were there any different uh, directions that characters took that, that surprised you or you didn't anticipate? Do you want to talk about that? You know, uh, in terms of the major characters, no. Uh, they They pretty much played their parts as I had imagine them playing their parts. Uh, the deep conflict that um, that the death at the heart of this, the death of Big John Many Deeds, who was a, a respected Ojibwe elder, plays in the story, um, that deep conflict that it causes in, in the O'Connor household was something that surprised me a little bit as I read it. I knew there was going to be some conflict, but the depth of that conflict and the threat that it in Cork's young Cork's mind that it's going to split up his family um, was a, an interesting development for me. Uh, but in terms of uh, the adjunct characters, particularly those who play a part in the mysteries, there are there's more than one mystery in this story, um, did surprise me in, in, in how their parts ended up being played. You know, David, I don't know how you uh, go about um, writing your mysteries, because I know your work on uh, Wounded Horse, is that? Uh, That's right. Is that the one you work on now? Um, yes. So, boy, I really want to ask you more about that. So let's save some time for that. I want to explore that a great deal more. And I have some questions for you about uh, about uh, Winter Count uh, as well. Um, but, oh gosh, what was I saying? <laughs> I lost my train. We're just talking about if we went in a different direction and what surprised yeah. you and then, and then preparate, you know, preparing to write. Yeah, I, so I don't know how you go about creating your mysteries. Um, I have two different approaches to my stories, depending upon the kind of story I'm going to write. So if I'm going to write a story in my Cork O'Connor series, you know, I think a mystery is such a tightly woven fabric of storytelling. Everything depends so significantly on everything else. And um, I think that the success of a mystery hinges largely on the timing of the reveals. When do you give the reader the clues that are going to be necessary to solving the mystery that's at the heart of the story? So when I write a Cork O'Connor novel, typically I'll think that story through as significantly as I can uh, before I ever put my fingers to the keyboard. In fact, in the old days, I would uh, I would outline it chapter by chapter so I would know how what each chapter was supposed to do in moving the story forward. I don't do that anymore because once I've thought the story through in my head, I can keep it uh, pretty well there. 
I really didn't know where I was going with this one. <laughs> oh. I, I had no idea. I entered it knowing that I wanted it to be a death uh, from which two different, there would be two different perspectives of the death. There would be the perspective of the white populace and there would be the perspective of the Anishinaabe uh, people of, uh, of the Iron Lake uh, Reservation. And I wanted to talk about how truth depends upon the perspective from which you view an event and how you can be so invested in your your idea of the truth and uh, and and maybe still be way off. So I uh, that I just kind of went into it with that thought and uh, and discovered it a lot of the story as I was going along. I, you know for I got to tell you honestly, for me, plot is the least interesting part of what I do. You know, you need a good plot there. It's got to, you've got to have that solid skeleton support all of the beautiful meat that you put on that. Agreed. All the narrative things that, you know, the rich characterizations and the profound sense of place and the powerful language and the themes, all of those things have to have something good to hang on. But it's really all that other stuff that I like. You know, creating the characters and 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 creating that profound sense of place and, and the atmosphere and figuring out how to weave the themes and the important issues into it uh, seamlessly. So, um, so I had a I had a lot of trouble with the plot. <laughs> quite honestly, I was hacking my way through that one um, pretty much all the way to the end. You know, it's it's funny when I think of the great books that have shaped me and that I that I return to and stick in my head. I rarely come back to a plot point and and remember, oh yes, it was that plot point that surprised me. It's a character moment or a, a scene, a dialogue exchange, something that surprised me. Those are the moments that stick with me anyway. Having said that, I'm I'm struggling with plot right now myself because if you don't have that good skeleton, you're not gonna be able to hang the other stuff on. So I'm uh I'm I'm working my way through my the plot of my second novel right now. So Anyway, so it's great to hear that you started off not maybe with a complete understanding of where you were going. So, so. With, with Winter Counts, did you have a, a pretty clear idea of where you were going with that from the get-go? Yes and no. I, I had a pretty good idea of Act 1 and 2, but Act 3, um, I rewrote a couple of times. I did not have a good idea of how the book would finish. And I've, I've written about this story before, so if anybody's had the misfortune to read any of my uh, other writings. You you probably have heard this story, but I was at a writer's residence in New Hampshire called uh, McDowell, and I just was struggling to end this book. And I put on one of my favorite musicians, Neil Young, and he has a very wow. dark, dark uh, uh, album called Tonight's the Night. And I'm and I'm playing pool with uh, Peter Gizzy, a poet and a composer. And somebody puts on Tonight's the Night. It's this dark theme. And all of a sudden, it came to me. And I put down the pool stick and I ran to my cabin. And I stayed up all night and I wrote that that ending. So that is a, a true story. So thank you, Neil Young. So <laughs> <laughs> inspiration comes from the oddest of places, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, let me let me jump on this because you know, um, I know what I took away from Lightning Strike. What you know, and and I and, and you just mentioned themes and and such, and and I I sense that you know themes and big ideas play a large role as you're writing. What do you hope that readers take away from this book? I know what I took away from it, but but what what do you hope that that they take away? What what would be your hope? Well, there are a number of things. Um, you know, the inspiration for this book actually came from a friend of mine who is uh, a member of the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe Tribal Police, mm. and uh, and he told me about the Relocation Act of 1956 and the devastating effect that it had on Native communities everywhere. And I was completely ignorant uh, of that misguided piece of legislation uh, until uh, until Monty told me about it. Um, so I knew that that was, that was something I wanted to put in the story. Yet another instance of how um, how the white majority has really done its best to um, to shatter native cultures, to disperse native people, um, and so I wanted that to be a part of the story that I was going to tell, um, and I wanted then on top of that to talk about prejudice, and prejudice exists 
you know, on both uh, across the color spectrum. And so um, there are a lot of white folks who have a lot of stereotypic misguided ideas about native people and native people have a lot of stereotyped and misguided ideas about white folks. And I wanted to talk about how at some point we need to come together and recognize the, the commonalities in us, um, how we all grieve the same way, how we all hope the same way, how we all love the same way. Um, and so that was a part of what I wanted uh, the reader to come away with, because we see that on both sides in this story. Um, I also wanted, honestly, I wanted, you know, I do have agendas in my Cork O'Connor series, and part, I'm not Native, David, I have not a drop of Native blood in me, but that doesn't mean that I don't understand the difficulties of the Native people. And so I, I often have an agenda of trying to bring to the attention, particularly white readers, um, issues that they need to be aware of, um, ideas that they need to rethink. Um, so I, I hope readers walk away from this story rethinking some of the ideas that they've had. But I also wanted to talk about families. I wanted to talk about the difficulty every family encounters across the course of, of you know, your life together as a family. I want to talk, talk about the forces that seek to divide families, and there are many, and then what it is in the end that holds families together, um, which I think is um, love and understanding. What can I say? <laughs> that sounds so cliche, but I think it is. Well, you know, let me just, I want to spin a little bit off of that. You know, um, I, I am a father of two sons. My sons are 16 and 14. And so, the, and my own father has passed on. And so reading this book, the reason that parts of it hit me very hard is because, as I said in my endorsement of this book, this is a story about fathers and sons. It's, it's about bigger issues, but it's also a story of fathers and sons. And so it, it hit me pretty deeply. So let me just say that I don't think it's cliche. Um, you know, it, it hit me very deeply, you know, thinking about my own relationship for my sons and made me think about my dad, who's been gone now 20, 20 some years. Um, and then shifting to the political, in case folks didn't know, the Relocation Act, in my day job, I'm a professor of Native American studies. So if you don't know, if folks are tuning in and you don't know what the Relocation Act is, it was an effort by the U.S. government to pay for Native Americans to move away from their reservation communities into cities. So they would pay for them to leave. Um, but then when they got there, they often would find, you know, there weren't jobs, um, housing was problematic, um, there was prejudice, and there was no way for them to come back. Now, yeah. some would say that the Relocation Act was an effort to try to divide the solidarity of Native communities. I mean, I'll leave the analysis to others, but that's one interpretation. So if you don't know, the Relocation Act uh, uh, was a very real thing, and some say an effort to try to break up Native communities. And so. in fact, whole Native communities disappeared as a result of it. It was a devastating piece of legislation. It, it you know, was. Fathers and sons, when I when I read Winter Count, I, Winter Counts, I thought, fathers and sons, and lightning strike, fathers and sons. You're a father, you are also a son. I'm a father, I was also a son. So seeing that struggle uh, from both sides was, uh, it wasn't difficult for me to, to give you Liam's perspective, Cork's father, and also adolescent Cork's perspective as he tries to figure out who he is separate from his father, separate from his family which is a struggle for every every adolescent. And you did that so well with Virgil and Nathan. Thank you. You know, Virgil is not Nathan's father. Uh, Nathan's father is is out of the picture, but Virgil is is has assumed the role of father. Uh, and that that reflects a native concept we have in the Lakota world called Tiyoshpae, which is extended family. So natives tend to view the family unit as not just the nuclear family, but, but a, a broader unit anyway. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I I very much tapped into my own feelings as a father when I wrote Winter Counts. My son David, upon whom the character of Nathan is largely based, has never read my book. I have said to him <laughs> monthly, I'm like, David, maybe it's time now for you to actually read the book. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not a reader. 
I, I, it breaks my heart. He's 16. I don't know. Hopefully he'll come around. My but kids don't read my books either, David. <laughs> I, I'm just dad to them, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, well, listen, I, I just I want to say the lightning, you know, the lightning strike again. I just I can't rave enough about it. But I want to get a just a couple of things here. Um this is, you know, I, I before we went on the air here, I, I said to you, I'm I'm selfishly, I'm kind of curious. Your first novel, Iron Lake, won the Anthony and Barry Awards. Now, I am, as you have so kindly noted, currently writing the next Virgil Wounded Horse novel, which will be the second in a series. And I would love to hear your thoughts, you know, and I, I suspect there are probably a fair number of writers listening in tonight. How do you write the second book in a series, or for that matter, any book? Do you what what do you bring to the table to keep it fresh, but at the same time? You know, for somebody who may not have started with book one, or in your case, book books one through seventeen, you know, one through eighteen, I guess. Um, how do you how do you approach that? Do you want to tell talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, um, book one, book two, and book three were all very different uh, different animals for me. Um, Iron Lake, my debut novel, uh, I wrote over four years, across four years, had all the time in the world. You know, it was not under contract. Um, I had never tried a mystery before, so I was learning my way uh, into, you know, into the mystery territory. How do you how do you create suspense? All of that stuff, and um, and when Iron Lake did so well, and I got the second contract, you know, a lot of people came up to me and they said, "We found your book so suspenseful," and I thought, "Well, that's good. How the hell did I do that?" <laughs> so. So I set out with my second novel to explore suspense. I wanted to write a book that was really about suspense so I could understand how do you create suspense? Um, how, do you, how do you heighten suspense? How long do you hold a reader in suspense before you give them the, the payoff? So my second book was really, uh, uh, do you know the movie uh, Speed, uh, Sandra Bullock and, oh, yes. uh, and Keanu Reeves? So my second book is sort of speed on canoes as people <laughs> are going through the boundary waters going like bats out of hell to try to, you know, get things accomplished. Um, and I had an outline for the second novel, which I did not have for the first. When I sold that second book, they wanted to know what it was going to be about. So I had to sit down and outline a story. And I found that exceptionally helpful to me because then mm -hmm. I, I had a sense of where I was going to go. And so when I sat down to write my third novel, I also outlined that. It changed significantly toward the end, but I outlined that. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to start outlining. That's going to help me. Um, but I still felt, I don't know, David, I felt like an imposter. I felt like, you know, they're calling me a writer and I'm still not really sure what I'm doing here. <laughs> And, and I'm not sure you ever really get, I don't care how many books you, you publish, I'm not sure you ever really get, get beyond that. I think if you're a good writer, you don't get beyond that. Because if you're a good writer, it's just like you said, you're always looking for something new, something fresh, something different. You're always trying to push your limitations yeah. and grow. Yes. That, that, that's great news for all of us that are like struggling to write book two or three or four or whatever that because I think we all kind of feel like gosh how did I how did I do that how how did I pull this off I've I've tried to stay away from my reviews I've read the newspaper reviews but the online reviews I've I've stayed far away from on Goodreads and such because I just have a feeling that I'll start writing to what you know they critique so I've 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 not yet and, and plan to never look at those but that is really wonderful advice. How, how, I think, you know, sticking with this topic just a little bit more, um, how long these days does it take you to write a book on average? I mean, do you spend about a year and, and what is, what is your process? Again, I think those of us who are writers would, would love to hear somebody that is, you know, as experienced as you, you know, just your, a little bit of your process and, and how long it takes you to research and then put, you know, words to paper. You know, when I wrote Iron Lake, as I said, my first novel, I wrote it across four years. My second yep. novel, Boundary Waters, took me two years. My third novel, Purgatory Ridge, took me a year and a half. And then my publisher called me out to New York City and sent me down and said, Kent, we want to make a big writer out of you. But if we're going to do that, we have to be guaranteed you can give us a book a year. Ooh. Yeah, I crapped my pants. <laughs> and uh, and then I decided, yeah, I want to be a big writer. <laughs> so so what I found, what I have found is, is that when you write a series, you don't have to recreate the wheel. 
um, you already have characters that readers uh, are familiar with. You have a setting that readers begin to know very well. You have elements of a story that they're going to expect you to put in there. So you have a lot, um, a foundation already laid. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, okay, on this found familiar foundation, what can I do that's new? What can I do that's different, surprising? Mm -hmm. It will keep me interested as well as keeping readers mm -hmm. interested. Mm -hmm. So uh, so now it takes me about eight months to, I'm, I'm a fairly slow writer. It takes me about eight months. But when I'm at the end of that, I have created my first draft is as good as I can possibly get it mm -hmm. in, in my thinking. Then I'll go back and I'll start do, doing the revision. But I usually only do one significant revision before I send it to my agent uh, to be read. Um, I, I I don't know how you write. I When you write, I, for... 40 years, my alarm clock has gone off at six o'clock in the morning, seven days a week, get myself up and I spend the first two or three hours of the day writing. That way I have the, I have the stuff that I love first thing in the morning. I inspire myself and then I can go out and give to the world whatever I need to give to it uh, because I've already really taken care of that important part of myself. So that's pretty much how I approach my work. That's pretty much my process. I would love to know a couple of things. First of all, your process, because I, I don't know about you. One of the things I love about a conference, uh, when we when all writers get together, you know, end of the day, you've done your panels, you get down to the bar, you're drinking, <laughs> and you start talking about, okay, how do you how do you do it? What yeah. you know, when do you write? What inspires you? All of that stuff. So I'd love to know that. And I'd also love to know sort of where, if you're willing to share it, sure. where you are in Wounded Horse, because you've been at work on it for a while now. Well, my process is is very similar to yours. I am um, I'm on Mountain Time, so we're an hour earlier. So for me, it's sometime between four thirty and five a.m. I typically get up because Whoa. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean that that's more like five thirty your time, I would say. So um, you know, yeah, four thirty whatever time you're in, that's still damn early. <laughs> because everything starts happening around here with two boys that need to go off to school at at six thirty a.m. Things starts happening things start happening. And so I, I really need those two hours just, and it's quiet in here. The dogs aren't even up, they're snoring away, you know? And so that's really my time to write and think, I'll try if I can to, to get back to it, um, you know, at, at times during the day. I'm a professor, so I don't normally teach every day. Um, but of course there's grading, student conferences, you know, all that stuff. So I do have a a day job and I teach in a couple of low residency MFA programs. I teach at Regis University and the Pan-European MFA program at Cedar Crest College. And so those students deserve, you know, my full attention when they send me their their monthly packets. So it's it's, you know, I wish I could be one of those that can do eight hours a day. Unfortunately, it's just not like that. You know, you know I don't I honestly I don't know how people to do the eight hour a day thing do it because if I have really immersed myself deeply in the writing, I'm a little exhausted, emotionally exhausted when I come up from my writing. You know, I'm inspired in other ways, but I'm like, huh, that's that's done for the day. Oh yeah, it's it's exhausting. I tell my kids this all the time. You know, they think because I'm not out, you know waiting tables the way I did in my younger years or, or being a roofer, which I've also have done, you know, they think writing is easy, but it's actually physically taxing. It, it genuinely is. If you're, when you're really uh, uh, cranking So to answer the second part of your question, I am, I would say that I've got a really good start on the second book in uh, the, uh, the hope, what hopefully will be a series the Virgil wounded horse series. You know, I've worked out, I've got a couple of chapters down but mainly I, I, I have a, 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 the plot worked out. I did a complete, yeah, I completely changed the plot about four months ago for reasons that are not interesting here. Um, I was going to write about missing and murdered indigenous women. I went in a different direction. My friend, Craig Johnson, I'm sure you've met Craig. He, his book came out today and it's about missing and murdered indigenous women. And there were just other reasons. I, I, I felt that current events were outstripping the fictional world that I had because there's a lot happening right now. So I'm going with a whole different plot concept, but I had months of research into this plot line and then I had to yank it all up and uh, and start over. Yeah, you, you never get rid of anything though, David. So hold on to that. Down the road a piece, you never know. <laughs> it, it might, yeah, it might come aboard. It might come back in, in some form or the other. And I'm also changing uh, the title. My partner, who's in the other room, just signed a contract with Flatiron Books. And she has a book coming out. It's indigenous horror called uh, White Horse. And so we, we, we feel that maybe oh. two, 
two W horse books coming from the same household might yeah. be a little too much. Yeah. So, so anyway, indigenous um, horror, boy, <laughs> that sounds terrific. Is this like uh, in one of your interviews you referenced Martin Christmas Nightwing? Uh, yes. I'm not. I didn't know anybody else knew about Nightwing. <laughs> it's glad to see you know that novel. Nightwing is fantastic, but the, the the real great book that he wrote, maybe maybe not in terms so much in terms of the writing, but the Indians won. I don't know if I spoke about that in the in the interview that you heard, and I don't want to take this too far away from crime fiction. But Martin Cruz Smith, when he was just 26 years old, wrote a book called The Indians Won. It's an alternative history where natives win the war with the Americans and create a separate nation in the middle of the U.S., a giant. And so the U.S. is on the coast and the middle of the country is controlled by Native Americans. And so it's it's told in two timelines, the past and then, and then the present. Um, and so this is a fascinating book. It's out of print. And so I've talked to a couple of publishers said, you need to get this back into print. It's one of the, if you don't know, Martin Cruz Smith is native. Um, he, he, a lot of people don't think of him that way, but he is, he's Pueblo Indian. Um, and so the Indians won, I think is, is a really fascinating book and that he, that he did it at 26 years old is, is really impressive. So that's the book to find if you can get it. Well, you know, hopefully with the digital age, it'll come back at least as an ebook offering. Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Hey, you know, yeah, let me ahead. ask you a question. Um, you, in one of the interviews I read uh, that you gave, you talked about the fact that it, you you published um, Winter Counts in your um, as a middle aged writer. <laughs> I think of you as a young guy, but <laughs> middle aged writer. You know, I I published my first novel, Iron Lake, at almost forty eight years old. So um, so we both kind of did a lot before we came to this part of our journey. And I don't know about you, but I think everything that I did in the past helped to inform what I do now as a writer. Because, you know, I i don't know if you knew this. I lived in Denver for uh, 10 years. You have mentioned that to me, but I forgot about it till now. Can you tell us what, what were you? Were you, you had a job here? or? or? Yeah, I, I, uh, I was in my Hemingway-esque education period. So I was uh, working construction in Denver for about 10 years. This oh. is what I did, David. Yeah. I worked for the city and county of Denver Department of Parks and Rec Recreation, and I was part of a crew that helped build parks for the city of Denver. So when you go to Wash Park or you go to City Park or you go to Cheeseman Park, hey, I had a hand in building those things. Those are the great parks in Denver. So if anybody out there, you know, probably very few are from Denver. There are three great parks in the city of Denver, and those are all three that you just mentioned right there. So that that is wonderful to hear. This is just maybe of interest to no one but me, but where did you live in Denver? I'm just kind of curious. Across the street from City Park. Okay, okay. So, so I saw the Museum of uh, Natural History there outside my my window every day. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. We call that the Park Hill neighborhood, or part. So anyway, um, that that that's just so great to hear. I I had forgotten about that because uh, you mentioned that you live there, but I didn't know all this detail. But you know, coming back to your your larger thing, and I, I hope this is of interest to to writers and readers. We 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 bring so much of ourselves into our work. You know, I I did not grow up with money. Um, I'm the first in my family to go to college, graduate from college. Um, I've had to work since 14, age 14, full time. Mainly I worked in restaurants. I've washed dishes, bussed tables, cooked, you name it. You know, and so I a lot of restaurant stuff exists in winter counts because that's kind of the world that I knew. <laughs> I've done construction, I've done roofing, you know, all of these things. And then later in life, I've been a professor and I and I was and am an attorney, although I don't practice anymore. Um, but yeah, all of this I think kind of comes in. And so, you know, hopefully our books are the richer for it. Having said that, I just saw a list came out from the National Book Foundation, 35 under 35 or something like that. And, you know, that's great. Or 25 under 20, something like that. I don't know what it is. Yeah, and know. so, you know, they're, they're, they're tapping into a vein that, that I don't have. You know, my vein is like my years of just trying to put food on the table. But, <laughs> but how, how wonderful to hear that, that you lived in, in Denver and, and, and worked, you know, did real work. That's great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I stepped into the mystery community with Iron Lake, I looked around me and I saw so many people with gray in their hair. And uh, and it, it was obvious that uh, they had a lot of wisdom at this point in their lives to share. And so that's kind of how I think of it. And certainly 
winter counts had lots and lots of wisdom in it i so love that book and i try to i try to put a little wisdom into lightning strike as well hey you know we're probably coming up on a time when we should uh, check okay. in with john and see if there are any questions out there all right so yeah so we do have some questions um i don't know if we did it but david before we get into questions can you give everybody the elevator pitch for winter counts if they're not familiar uh, sure. So Winter Counts, my debut novel, came out uh, uh, last year uh, from Echo HarperCollins. The paperback just came out in July, and the British version comes out with a different cover, which I was uh, really interested to see. Uh, Simon & Schuster is bringing this out in England or the United Kingdom, and they went a different direction with the, the cover, which was cool to see. Um, Winter Counts, just the very, very brief pitch, is the story of Virgil Wounded Horse, who is a hired enforcer on the Rosebud Indian Reservation. Because of a law that really disadvantages Native Americans, we cannot, Native Americans cannot prosecute felony crimes that occur on their own lands. They must send these criminal cases off for prosecution to the FBI and U.S. attorney's offices. But they are declining to prosecute about 40% of these cases. So wrongdoers, our offenders are set free. So people will hire a private hired vigilante like Virgil Wounded Horse, he charges $100 for each tooth he knocks out and each bone he breaks. So the 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 story is, uh, the tale is of Virgil Wounded Horse and his attempt to bring justice to those who can't get it from the government. So that's the very brief sketch. Perfect. So since you mentioned covers, um, we had a question um, in the crowd. Do you guys have any say in your covers? Let's start with Kent. I do now but that wasn't always the case. <laughs> With Iron Lake, I remember my editor asked me, so what do you think the cover should look like? And I gave him some great ideas. And what they came out with was uh, absolutely, clearly they paid absolutely no attention to me. Uh, <laughs> the, the second book in the series, they sent me two, two cover uh, drafts. Which one do you like? I said, I like that one. And they went with the other one. Uh, <laughs> so finally I said, okay, if you're going to do, you know, if you want to evoke the Northwoods, you need to know what the Northwoods is like. So I sent them a photograph by one of our great photographers, Northwoods photographers here, a guy named Craig Blacklock. And they uh, they ended up actually getting the rights to the photograph I sent them for the third book. And um, and then it was they did a pretty good job, pretty good job, pretty good job. And then my standalone, I uh, began to I published uh, Ordinary Grace. And that was the first time really where I felt like I had a significant role in helping shape uh, the cover. And then when this tender land came out, I had the, the same, uh, the same opportunity to really weigh in until we got a cover that I just think is stunning lightning strike. Um, the initial cover of that was not to our liking. And so we, we worked on tweaking that. So yeah, now I have, um, I have some say, you know, publisher has the last word always. Mm -hmm. How about you, David? So HarperCollins gave me a couple of different designs and they asked me which I preferred, but we were all kind of agreed that the red cover with the upside down Buffalo was, was the right one. So there wasn't much dissension there. Um, for the British version, um, they, they said, we want to go with something that United Kingdom folks will, will uh, enjoy. So they, they asked for my input as well. But a strange thing happened just about a month ago. Um, I, I was at the Ragdale Writers Artist Colony in uh, uh, Lake Forest, Illinois, working on my book just, just three weeks ago. And I get an email out of nowhere from the cover artist in France who's going to do the cover for my French version for Galmeister Press. And I've never, and he's in the process of creating a drawing for it. And he spoke to me for an hour asking my, me questions about concepts and ideas. And that has never happened to me. And it was just really wonderful to have a visual artist, you know, take the time to speak to me and ask me what I thought Virgil looked like and lots of things. So it, it was really, really fun. Now I haven't yet seen what he's done, but I'm sure it's gonna be fantastic. <laughs> uh, so Kent, Patricia says that she came to your work after loving Ordinary Grace in this tender land. So she wants to know since Lightning Strike is a prequel, do you think that she could start there or do you recommend her going back and starting with Iron Lake? That's one of the things I like about uh, Lightning Strike. It's an excellent place to begin the series yeah. because it depends absolutely not at all on any 
previous knowledge of Cork O'Connor, mm-hmm. any of the elements, the whole shtick uh, for the series. Um, it is a. It will introduce you, I think, in a um, a really powerful way to uh, all of the elements that you'll find in the Cork O'Connor series. It will introduce you to the people that you're going to discover, the characters that you discover in this series. Um, it will give you an idea of who I am as a writer, what my voice is like. So I think it's just a wonderful place to begin. And if you like that, then I would say, I would recommend that you begin with the first book in the series, Iron Lake. And um, and again, I would recommend that you read them in order if you can for this reason. The 17 previous books in the series span 15 years in the lives of the characters. So if you begin at the beginning, what you do is you see the whole development, aging, um, changes of relationships uh, that come across the course of the series. So it's a much richer experience if you do it that way. That said, any writer of a long running series understands that a reader may come to your work in the 12th or the 15th or the 17th entry in the series. So each book has to stand alone. It has to be satisfying just within the covers of that novel. It can't depend on a reader's understanding of the history involved in all of these characters. So you could pick up any Cork O'Connor novel and God willing, really like it and decide you should go back to the beginning and start there. Yeah, As booksellers, we love it when authors have a long running series and they drop a prequel that far into the series. Cause like you said, it's always a nice, it's always a nice way to say, Hey, yes, there are all of these books, but you can jump in here. If, if you are a stickler for reading stuff in order, it's always a nice way to be able to say, Hey, here's a, here's a good way to introduce. You know, in a, a 17 book, 18 book series, that's a pretty daunting thing to face. So something like lightning strike, I think is, is, um, you know, I didn't think of it that way, really. That wasn't why I wrote it. But I think it's a wonderful entree to the series. Yeah. So Patricia also wants to know, she says, so did you know all of the details of um, Cork's past that are in Lightning Strike before you wrote this? Or did it, did it occur to you new as you were writing this book? I knew some of the details because I had uh, put them in previous um, entries in the Cork O'Connor series. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I wrote the story without making reference to all of those events. <laughs> and uh, when I sent the book to my the manuscript to my agent, she said, oh, Kent, 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 Kent. Don't you, don't you remember in this book, Cork did this, in this book, Cork did this, in this book, Cork. You, you know, you just glossed right over that. So I had to go back and restructure the story based on the history I'd already given Cork across the course of the series. But so much of who Cork is and so much of the, the, uh, the relational stuff, his friends at that point, uh, came to me as I wrote the story. So it sounds like you do not have a series Bible that you can refer back to as you're working. Yeah, wouldn't that be a good idea? David, create a series Bible now. I did it. I Good did it. You. Because I, 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 listen, I don't have 18 books in the series. I've just got one. And I was trying to remember, wait, what happened here? What happened there? I, and I, I, a reader said, why did you name this, 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 that? I'm like, Matt, I, I don't remember. So I, you know, so I, I actually went back and did like just a two page summary of everything. So I didn't mess it up. You know, you should make sure that you know the color of your character's hair and eyes and height. Um, you know, I got to tell you, one of my books, uh, Cork O'Connor has a son. And one of the stories, uh, Stephen, his son, begins the the novel in the third grade. And at the end of the story, he's in the second grade. <laughs> I miss, you know, and it wasn't because Stephen was held back or anything. I just, I just screwed it up. It's funny. Uh, so Susan wants to know, this is for both of you. We'll start with David this time. So who are three writers, living or dead, that you would want to meet? Oh, boy. Um, well, okay. Um, I- I'm going to start with Larry McMurtry, who just passed on oh, about choice. a year ago. Um, I was fortunate enough to win the Spur Award this year for, for best novel and best debut novel and best overall novel. And I uh, Spur is the Western Writers of America. And he won that award in 1985 for Lonesome Dove. And I'm in no way saying I should even be mentioned in the same breath as him. But Larry McMurtry has meant so much to me as, as a young man, um, you know, reading Lonesome Dove and actually started with All My Friends Are Going to Be Strangers and The Last Picture Show. All of these books are fantastic. And um, I heard he was perhaps not a warm fella, but I would love to 
you know, if only I could could have the chance just to speak with him. And you know, he was just a very erudite and 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 learned person. So so Larry McMurtry for sure. A second one would be John Cheever. This one always surprises uh, folks because John Cheever, I just love his prose, and I I loved those stories so much. And boy, the third one. Um, Boy, I'm I, I I'm gonna have to defer on that one because there's so many. I'm tempted to say something like really crazy, like Shakespeare, and find out did he really write the plays, you know, or not? <laughs> let me let me let me hand it over to Kent. You know, the first guy that comes to mind is Tony Hillerman. Uh, I do what I do because of Hillerman, and I never had the opportunity to actually meet him. I know his daughter Anne quite well. But I would love to have met uh, Tony uh, just to be able to tell him how influential he's been in, in terms of my own work. The other guy I'd like to meet because he's extremely influential in my writing is John Steinbeck. Oh. Um, one of the things, there are a couple of things I, I love about Steinbeck that I have really tried to uh, adopt in my own writing. First of all, his profound sense of place. When I read a when I read a novel, particularly set in, uh, one set in the Salinas Valley, I can see Steinbeck's heart in every line. And I know his love of that, his profound love of that place comes through. And so when I write about Minnesota, I try to, I try to write in the same way, um, a Valentine to this place that's my adopted home now. And I also like how, Stein, how compassionate Steinbeck was in his portrayal of those who are um, on the outside of our of our society, the, the downtrodden, um, those who have not. Um, and so I, you know, think of myself as a fairly compassionate writer in that regard as well. Um, and maybe the third one, oh, this is almost cliche. I'd love to meet Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> <laughs> Just because he's this enormous figure. And he was probably the first writer I ever... When I was 18 years old, my father insisted I read Ernest Hemingway, and I fell in love with the guy. And uh, I tried, well, I, you know, what I fell in love with was that mythic image of Hemingway. And I tried forever to write the great American novel, a la Ernest Hemingway, until I decided to hell with that. I'm going to write a mystery. So with uh, Lightning Strike coming out, so before that, it had been three years since we'd seen a Cork O'Connor book. So what was it like having written This Tender Land and taking a break from Cork and then being able to come back to him with this new book? It was um, an amazing experience. And I had the same experience when I left the Cork O'Connor series to write Ordinary Grace. Um, you know, there are stories that come to you and uh, and they compel you in such a way that you know you have to write them. And that was certainly true of Ordinary Grace. Um, it, in, in, my, uh, in my Anthony acceptance speech for Ordinary Grace, um, I said, this, this has always felt to me like the story I was meant to write. And it was the first time I'd ever felt that about one of my stories. I love the Cork O'Connor series, but this one felt this one felt true in an entirely different way. And I had that same experience when I wrote This Tender Land. It felt like a true story. It came from a place so deep inside me mm. um, that when I returned then to the writing of the Cork O'Connor series for both of those books, I, I felt completely refreshed and really ready to really ready to spend some time with Cork once again. Mm. So for this next question, my general disclaimer is you're not allowed to say each other's book because as we've been chatting, it's clear that you guys are fans of each other's. Um, so you can't name each other's books, but what is something that you've read lately that you loved? Let's start with Kent. You know, I'm going to mention a book. I'm going to mention two books. One is out there and it's been my favorite new discovery for a very long time. It's a book called Last Looks by an author named Howard Michael Gould. And, uh, and it is... Howard, uh, in that novel, introduces one of the most intriguing protagonists to come on uh, along in a very long time, a guy named Charlie Waldo, who is trying to pull his life together. And he will now he now allows himself on, to possess only 100 things. So he's also a detective. And so in the course of his investigations, if he's going to pick up a piece of evidence, he has to figure out what of the 100 things will he have to give up? It's just a delightful, uh, delightful character, uh, beautifully written. Uh, love that book. But I just finished an ARC for a novel that won't be out for a while that I think is going to be just a stunning novel. It's uh, written by... Um, it's written by... <laughs> <laughs> crap. <laughs> Matt Goldman. 
It's written by Matt Goldman, who is a Twin Cities author. Uh, he, he has written a, a detective series here, but mm -hmm. this is a standalone. It's called Carolina Moonset, oh. and it's just a, a wonderful, evocative, beautiful sense of place, terrific characters, love the dialogue, um, uh, mystery, heart, you know, heartfelt. Carolina Moonset, it's going to be out sometime next year, but I don't know when. It'll be out uh, next May. Is it? Okay. Well, yeah. thank you, John. Sure. <laughs> How about you, David? Well, I've, I've been reading some new books, too, that aren't quite out yet. So mm -hmm. let me give one that I just had the, the pleasure and honor of reading an early uh, uh, edition and writing endorsement of it. Um, this gentleman, Robert Justice, has a new book coming out from Crooked Lane called They Can't Take Your Name. Now, it is set in Denver. And so right, right away, I love that. Um, cause there are a handful of books set in Denver, uh, uh, Dunning wrote some back in the seven eighties, I believe. Um, this is a great, great, great book, uh, about somebody who's wrongfully imprisoned, uh, and on death row and in fact, wrongfully executed, uh, for a crime he did not commit Robert justice. They can't take your name. So I did a podcast with Robert, um, about, uh, eight months ago or so we're talking after the broadcast. He's like, where are you from in Denver? I'm like suburb of Aurora. He's like, oh, where'd you go to school? I'm like, Aurora Central. He's like, me too. So we ended up going to the same high school, which is not at the same time, but that was just deeply weird. So this is his debut novel, um, again, and and I, I I really enjoyed reading it. So so there's that. Um, I I want to give a, a, a shout out to another book. If if you're looking for a native book that isn't necessarily a crime novel, let me also refer you to a wonderful friend of mine, Brandon Hobson who has a book called The Removed. Now it's been out about seven, eight months, but it is a wonderful Cherokee story of a family in crisis. So it is just the, he was nominated for the National Book Award um, three years ago in fiction and it's just uh, superb. Um, it's really good. And then I got to give a shout out to my good friend, Sean A. Cosby. I, if you're watching this show, uh, this broadcast. I'm pretty sure you know who S.A. Cosby is, and you probably know about his book, Razorblade Tears. But let me tell you, it's 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 the thriller of the year. You know, it's a true thriller, uh, Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. It's wonderful. It's great. Sean is one of the good guys in the crime fiction world, and I just tore through it, and I was honored to write a little essay for it for Book of the Month Club. And so, you know, if you haven't read it, that's that's a good one as well. <laughs> And if you guys have not read it or you haven't read any of those and you're curious, I just dropped links to all of those books um, in the comments if you want to order them from Murder by the Book. We do still have some signed copies of Razor Blade Tears. So if you're looking for a signed copy for that, uh, we also got to do a very, it ended up being a very odd event with Sean when the book came out. Unfortunately, it was when one of the big tropical storms was blowing through his area. So he was able to call in on his phone, but he couldn't get the Wi-Fi to work for the camera. So Alex Segura interviewed him. So Alex was on camera and Sean was just doing it um, through his phone with no audio. So it was almost <laughs> like a like a, a radio interview. But it's definitely worth checking out because he's hearing him talk is great. Um, so I think that is going to do it for the evening for us. So for anybody who might have joined us late, we have been chatting with William Kent Kruger, whose new book, Lightning Strike, has just come out. We do still have some signed copies available if you have not picked one of those up. And we've been talking with David Heskel Wombly Wyden, whose novel Winter Counts is now out in paperback. If you missed any part of our chat, you can um, rewatch it on Facebook or YouTube. Once we're done, they will archive it. Sometimes YouTube takes just a little bit longer for it to pop up, um, but those are both up there. And as I mentioned, while you're there, there is a wealth of um, virtual events that we've done over the last year and a half. Pretty much anybody who's crime fiction who has had a book out in the last year and a half, we've, we've been able to chat with them, which has been one of the nice things about this. But David, thank you again so much for, for joining this evening. And Ken, again, I'm so sorry we weren't able to do this in the store, but I'm so glad we at least got to chat and everybody got to hear about the new book. I have a book coming out next year. Let's see what we can do. Oh, yeah, definitely. Every, fingers crossed. Everybody mask up, get vaccinated so that way we can get back to in-store stuff because we would love to, nothing more to have Ken in the store and be able to hear him chat with readers and get to meet readers too. And hopefully by time then, David's second book will be out and we'll be able to get him to Houston too. Which <laughs> Love to. Love. Yeah. Gentlemen, you guys have a good evening and we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks.